Hey there everyone, how's it going? Tarun here. In this episode, we are going to look at production hardening of HashiCorp Vault Server. Now, what is production hardening? When you want to secure a server and prevent attacks to it or prevent vulnerabilities or at least reduce it to a certain extent, we can call that as production hardening or hardening in simple words. So in this particular episode, we are going to look at how you can actually um, secure a Vault Server beyond just setting it up as a production server. Because if you had watched my previous episodes where I showed you how to set up a dev server or a prod server, I told you prod version of setting up vault server is really secure than setting up a dev server. And that is true, okay? But beyond that, there are several steps. In fact, 18 steps to be precise, which vault recommends us, which we'll be going through each and one of them in this particular episode. Let's begin. Now, the first recommendation that they give is do not run as a root. So use a dedicated unprivileged service to run Vault instead of running it as a root or administrator account. So we usually have this habit, right? Like whichever service we install, we just run it as root account or the root user of on the uh, Linux box. But what Vault is recommending is do not run any process as root user. This actually does not only hold for Vault, but also holds good for any of any other services that we are using. Say we are installing Nginx server or Apache server. We do not actually want to run it as a root user. We have to just run it as say you can create an Nginx user and you have to make sure that Nginx process, process runs as an Nginx user and not a root user. And I came across this uh, beautiful short blog by Ben Kane where he says that one easy way to do this is to avoid running applications as root whenever possible. When an application is running as the root user, that application has the ability to control your server. If an attacker gains control of that application, then they can perform any task they want on your server. If you're running AC Linux, then there is an additional security control. But even then, an application that runs as root can potentially disable all of your additional security controls. So the example that he gives is, say someone is running an uh, Apache based server, which allows upload of files. But there is a certain bug which allows the upload of JPEG file, but does not actually verify whether the uploaded file is in image. So what happens an attacker who knows this can upload some sort of binary that executes itself, but with .jpg or .jpeg extension to the server. This binary goes to the server. And since Apache itself is a root process, this binary takes advantage of that and creates an equal root user on that particular box. Now what the attacker does is, he has access to this root user, which has been created, right? And thereafter, he has access to the entire box. So this might be the thing that Vault is suggesting us to not run the Vault process at, as a root user. Now coming to the second point, allow minimal write privileges. The unprivileged Vault service account should not have access to overwrite its executable binary or any Vault configuration files. Only directories and files for local vault storage or audit logs should be writable by the vault user. So in the first step, we saw that vault should not be run by the root user. Okay. At the same time, the user that is running vault should not have write privileges to the executable binary or any vault configuration files. Because if in case he has this ability to write to the vault binary, then he'll be able to modify the vault binary code. Or if he has ability to write to, to write to the vault configuration files, he'll be able to change the configurations, right? So thereafter, they're asking us to not give write privileges unnecessarily. And where should it have? It should have only to the vault local storage or the audit logs that it is writing. Uh, we will check as, as to how you can enable audit logs in the upcoming uh, say points. Next, coming to the third point, end-to-end -end TLS. 
wall should always be used in TLS in production. If intermediate load balancers or reverse proxies are used to front vault, TLS should be used for all network connections between every component of the system to ensure all traffic is encrypted in transit to and from the vault. So what we see is, say there is an application running and there is vault. So this application wants to fetch secrets from this vault. But in usual situations, we might want to try to keep a load balancer in between uh, so that when there are multiple applications and they're going to make a lot of requests to vault, we want to ensure like, uh, first of all, we can, we can, we'll be able to um, apply even more secure security mechanisms in that, uh, in, in those Nginx boxes. But beyond that, we also want to load balance the requests, right? So when these requests connect from the application to Nginx and Nginx, Nginx, which is the load balancer here and Nginx to the backend, which is the vault, we want to make sure that this end to end connectivity from app to the load balancer to vault and back to vault is completely secure. So this is done by uh, generating uh, SSL certificates, using them, using the public cert in the application, uh, maintaining the keys in vault and also in uh, Nginx. So if you had watched my production setup of vault, there I have exactly covered as to how you can generate a certificate, use it in vault's configuration and thereby set up a TLS enabled vault. So if you are interested more about how to set this up, please go and watch that video. Now coming to the next point, which is the fourth point, disable swap. So if you're aware of what swap is, uh, to tell in simple words, say we have uh, memory for a machine, right? Say we have two gigs of memory and say available memory is around uh, 1.5 gigs. So what happens is say several process processes are using this memory and the memory keeps increasing to a very high value. Now what this swap ability gives us is after a certain level, the uh, memory managing uh, process, what it does is it takes out unused pages from the memory and it stores in the swap section of the hard disk so that it will have extra space to store other stuff in the memory, right? This could be a helpful mechanism, but when it comes to vault, are you able to think of what could possibly go wrong here? So the thing is vault kind of stores the key in the memory, right? It doesn't write to the disk because when it writes to the disk, anyone who has access to the uh, disk will be able to um, read the key and parse it and use it. But what happens when vault keeps it in the memory and uh, in such a way that no one is able to access it, no normal user is able to access it. So that becomes secure, right? But what if you had enabled swap? And what if the memory management program moves those particular pages in which this key is placed into the disk? So anyone having access to the disk will be able to read and um, say steal the key, right? So that's what they want you to do. They want you to disable swap. Okay, coming to the next point, disable core dumps. So a user or administrator that can force a core dump and has access to the resulting file can potentially access vault encryption keys. So preventing core dumps is a platform specific process on Linux, setting the resource limit to zero disables core dumps. Now, what are core dumps? I again found another uh, good article about this. So when, okay, a core dump is a file that gets automatically generated by the Linux kernel after a program crashes. This file contains the memory, register values, and the call stack of the application at the point of crashing. Now, does this happen only when the uh, application crashes on its own? No, there are also signals that you can use to generate a core dump. I'm sure as a Linux user, you would have definitely used the kill command to kill a process, right? You, you, you might have used kill minus nine and the uh, PID number. But here, they, they have given us a couple of signals here, which is sig abort and sig alarm. And these, are, these can be actually used in order to force a core dump 
of a program so once you disable go dump this uh, does not give the permission to any user to in order to generate a core dump and thereby uh, it is preventing the access to the vault encryption keys right coming to the next point single tenancy vault should be the only main process running on the program so say you have vault and side by side you have another uh, program running on the machine which is listening on a different port you might ask uh, you might ask me what the problem is here but take the first case where i told you someone is able to access the server find a bug in it and able to take control of the machine so what happens in that case here because of a different program which is on the same machine you are letting the whole machine into becoming vulnerable when the hacker gets access to the whole machine of course even vault is in danger isn't it so that's what this uh, point is about they are asking us to use a dedicated machine for vault if possible they are asking you to use a bare metal instead of a vm and in the worst case they are asking us to prefer a container coming to the next point firewall traffic so so they here they are recommending us to use a proper firewall that filters requests that allows requests only from certain uh, ips and which has certain mechanisms to block uh, say certain type of attacks all those things into the vault next avoid root tokens so if you again uh, watched my dev setup or the prod setup of vault you would remember that when we had initialized the vault server it gives us back the root token so this root token is like a sudo user on a linux machine and it has all the capabilities on vault so if you have this root token lying around anyone can find it out from a file or say they hack and get the root token or you keep it somewhere and they get it and all those things right so in order to prevent that once you get a root token when you initialize and you have done the basic setup that is needed they are asking you to get rid of the root token now you might ask me what if i needed the root token in the future that situation will definitely come that is why i have picked up another um, tutorial blog from which you will be able to generate a root token so how do you generate the root token again when you had initialized the servers you would have got the seal keys right the keys using which you can unseal the servers and along with that you will get the root token so using these unseal keys we are going to generate the root token say you had the root token and you had deleted it one fine day you come back and you realize that you need the root token again so what do you do so you run the command vault operator generate hyphen root space hyphen init this gives you a nonce value and it gives you a otp right when you want to unseal it sorry when you want to generate the root token you will have to run the command vault operator generator hy generate hyphen root where it will ask you for the nonce and it will ask you for the unseal key you will have to pass on the nonce to the other person who has the unseal key so all the uh, people uh, all the operators who have the unseal key have to enter the nonce and the unseal key say there are five unseal keys to be entered in the last uh, unseal key when it has to be run what will happen is he will he has to he has to give the nonce and the unseal key right and then that last unseal process will give back an encoded token right now how do we get the root token out of this so in order to generate the root token as a final step the user has to run vault operator generator root and decode and pass the encoded token otp pass the otp that you got in the first step right so this process has been uh, designed brilliantly here where the first user gets the otp and the nonce he passes along the nonce to rest of the uh, operators who have to unseal it by passing the nonce and the last person to unseal will get the encoded token and the final way in which they generate the token is by 
getting the encoded token from the last person and also entering the OTP from the first person in order to get a root token. So they have made sure that even though I am an operator who has an unsealed key, um, I alone cannot go to the server and generate a root token. I need everyone to come together and join hands. Right? So that's a brilliant way of uh, generating root token. So you need not worry about uh, losing your root token. Right? Awesome. Our next point, enable audit logging. Right? Now we come to the audit logging part. So here in vaultproject.io, uh, I'm displaying the audit devices page. Well, I've told that audit devices are the components in Vault that keep a detailed log of all requests and response to Vault because every operation with Vault is an API request and response. The audit log contains every authenticated interaction with Vault, including errors. And you will also be able to uh, include multiple audit devices. So what does this mean? Let's come to it. Like uh, how to enable and disable audit devices. Let's let's first look at that. So when a vault server is first initialized, no auditing is enabled, right? So when you saw us setting up the dev and prod server, we did not do the step of enabling an audit file. But once you set up a production server, you will have to run this vault audit enable file and give the, uh, say the mode of uh, audit device, which is in this example, let's take file path and you mention a file path to which the audit logs are uh, sent to. But when I was telling you about multiple uh, audit devices, Vault also provides us an ability to log to multiple audit devices so that you can also log at one place and take a backup at another and make sure that even if one of the file is tampered or corrupted, you have another backup file out there, right? So this is about audit devices. And also one more thing Walt is suggesting is disable shell command history. So we all have the habit of using the root tokens. So that time you can notice that when you run the command Walt login and you put the root token and you most of the time forget it and log out from the box. So any user who has a sudo access can actually log in into the box, type the history command, uh, of course with sudo privileges, and he'll be able to see the list of commands that were run. In that there can be uh, say the, the root token itself might be, available, might be available or you were trying to store some uh, secrets providing the key value pair and that key value was present in the history all those sorts of issues are there right but there are certain ways in which you can uh, actually yeah, you can actually erase the history but than that there are ways that vault provides you in in which you can mask the secrets that you are uh, storing in into vault actually when you run those commands either you can uh, give hyphen at the end of the command instead of providing the value in such a way that uh, it takes the it hides the value when you enter it or you can read the um, value from a file um, in the form of key value pair or you will also be able to mm, uh, you will be able to export a variable in such a way that it will not uh, consider vault commands into the history file. So these are what they uh, recommend you to provide. So this is one thing. Going to the next point, upgrade frequently. So vault is actively developed and upgrade, up, updating frequently is important to incorporate security fixes and any changes in default settings such as key lens and cipher suites. So this is also important because you know, people are always constantly testing products and they might come across certain bugs and dev teams are always in, um, say, on, on their toes to, to deploy new versions and new secure versions of uh, any product. So we as users of that product is always better to stay at the uh, recent version or at least N-2 or N-3 version of that particular product. That's what they're recommending us here. Then. Synchronized clocks. So they're asking us to use a service like NTP or uh, Crony, which actually maintains the synchronicity of the uh, your particular box, box clock with the actual clock that you want it to be synced with. So you might uh, actually be 
surprised about this if you if you have already not come across this but machines are not actually aware of time right so it is very important to install app, um technologies that keeps the machine's time in sync with the uh, clock that you rely the most so most people tend to use the google's uh, ntp servers and they configure their machine in such a way that it is always in sync with google's ntp server to the millisecond possible because there are a lot of server a lot of services a lot of technologies that will not function efficiently or might even malfunction if the time between its own a uh, group of machines or its own fleet of machines is not in sync right so that's what they are recommending for vault also next coming to restrict storage access so vault um, we have we know that vault encrypts all of the data it stores those data in its storage backend you might ask so, okay so vault encrypts the data and stores it at a place so what's the problem if anyone gets access to it say i get access to that storage what if i try to delete some file or what if i add uh, some more information to the file or something like that right that is also dangerous we do not want anyone to corrupt the data or tamper the data even though they are not uh, getting something they should not destroy it isn't it so how do you prevent that so you'll have to restrict the storage access either you change the permissions or you prevent ssh access to the uh, backend itself or you restrict the users who can get access to the Uh, storage next point no clear text credentials now there is this seal stanza in the uh, vault configuration which we have not come across because um, we generally tend to use the shamir cryptography that uh, vault basically gives us so we actually saw about this in our uh, previous vaults uh, introduction podcast or the episode where i told you how Uh, vault uses this shamir algorithm to get the unseal keys combine them and how it uh, uh, gets the encryption key and gets the master key and the encryption key and enc- and uh, decrypts the data right so instead of using the default algorithms vault actually provides you to uh, use your own set of uh, trusted cryptographic technologies so that's what this seal stands at us so what vault is telling us do not store your cloud credentials or the hardware security module pin in clear text within the seal stanza right that's what it's saying because you would have hosted it on that server or they, someone might have access to your vault configuration which gives them uh, in fact access to this hsm module right that's what they are recommending next point use safest algorithms available now Uh, this is actually true for uh, any other service like if you are having an nginx server which is serving on uh, ssl connection which it should be actually so there are certain tls versions that you should avoid and the higher the tls version say 1.2 and 1.3 is what is recommended for you to be using now and if possible 1.3 is all recommended but there might be certain devices uh, certain certain legacy devices that your customers might be using which would not support the algorithm used by uh, 1.3 that is one downside of it but considering the uh, security that you get considering the privacy of the data that you give to your users it's a good uh, trade off so one such example is uh, vulnerabilities with regarding to cbc mode symmetric decryption using padding so this there is this uh, certain cipher suite um, that deals with cbc which is cipher block chaining so what microsoft says is microsoft believes that it's no longer safe to decrypt data encrypted with cipher block chaining cbc mode of symmetric encryption when verifiable padding has been applied without first ensuring the integrity of the cipher text except for very specific circumstances this judgment is based on currently known cryptographic research and one more thing they tell that is a padding oracle attack is a type of attack against encrypted data that allows the attacker to decrypt the contents of the data 
without knowing the key so this is the vulnerability that comes up with uh, this cbc mode ciphers and in order to avoid these sort of uh, uh, vulnerabilities only vault is asking you to use maybe tls 1.3 that ensures modern in encryption algorithms that are used to encrypt the data in transit and forward secrecy now coming to following best practices for plugins so vault uh, gives you ability to use plugins so what this plugins uh, gives you ability is like say you can consider your vault application like a lego blocks like a set of lego blocks and if you want to add a new plugin or a new feature you can just take the lego block and place it in right so that's how vault um, talks about its plugins but what it's telling you is the plugins that are officially from hashicorp vault are actually safe and are tested but be aware of other sorts of uh, external plugins or the plugins developed by other organizations or people that you're trying to use so that's what that like next non deterministic file merging so when running the vault command to bring up the server it gives you an ability to append a uh, config file to the command hyphen config so there is a feature where you can use this hyphen config multiple times so in order to give uh, say vault dot uh, hcl and then you want to append a folder where you have multiple configurations which also you want to apply to the server you can give hyphen config again and attach that folder so what they're telling is this is actually non deterministic and some sort of inconsistency in the settings between the files could lead to inconsistencies in the vault settings so make sure that uh, you know what you're doing there right next coming to the last point in which you can secure your server use correct file system permissions so always ensure appropriate permissions are applied to the files prior to starting vault especially those containing sensitive information so if you talk about the vault configuration file or the storage that is being used or the vault binary that is uh, being executed you have to make sure that proper um, uh, permission file permissions linux os file permissions are present to those files you have to make sure that only people uh, who are allowed to read those files are allowed to read and as we spoke you have to uh, make sure that the vault process itself is not able to write to these uh, binaries or write to its uh, configurations unnecessary users are actually even kept off from the machine right so these are all the uh, whichever they recommend as the basic things that have to actually be there but apart from that they have also told you to disable ssh or remote access to that whole system itself that's one thing and they ask you to use a few system d security features and uh, immutable upgrades so they are asking you they are asking you to keep it all persistent in such a way that it doesn't change and if something has to change then it will go with the new version and new server which is which is brought online they are asking you to configure ac linux and app armor and uh, they are asking you to keep optimal u limit um and ke keeping it i mean asking you to consider to review the u limit for maximum amount of open files connection before going to production uh, because they might need some increasing and also regarding docker containers where they are asking you to leverage the memory lock feature inside the vault container um which we will likely need to use the overlay fs2 maybe it's a overlay file system 2 uh, i'm yet to read up on that but on docker when using vault as docker containers itself uh, they're asking you to leverage the memory lock feature uh, but also we saw earlier that they are recommending you to not run vault in, inside uh, containers not even inside vms but only uh, only inside bare metals so we can actually ignore this point as much as possible so these are all the uh, if you ask me they're like gems that uh, hashicorp vault has uh, given us in order to secure our own servers uh, i will link this uh, article in this particular podcast or video that you are watching by the way if you are watching the video it is at it is on youtube developer tarun channel and if you want to listen to the podcast it's available on anchor uh, spotify apple podcast google podcast uh, and other places right thank you so much for joining in this episode 
uh, in case you are listening to this episode please let me know how it was and also let me know what you all want me to speak about uh, i am just exploring on my own and as i explore i just share it with you all thank you so much thank you for listening to this episode see you all in the next episode bye